moment, I'm going to have you guys clap your hands. On to the beat. Well, 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 pause, 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 pause. Sure. You guys are good. You guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are so good. You're going to follow Jenna and Amy as they clap their hands to the best of your ability. And if you give up halfway through the song, that's okay. God's grace covers you. We're going to sing standing. have a seat. As we continue to worship this morning, let me share this passage of scripture with you. We begin to focus our hearts and minds on worshiping. It's so exciting to be here. Let's begin to focus our hearts and mind. Here's a passage from Isaiah chapter 43. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And the flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your king. And this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a 
path through the mighty waters. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who drove out the chariots and the horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and they lay them never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like the wicked. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Let's pray together. I'd love for you to take this time, this moment, just to focus your heart on the fact that God is the one who makes a way for you. He's your way maker. He's the one who has promised to be with you. He has promised to walk with you. He's promised not to allow the waters to sweep over you. And for some of us right now, it may feel like we're barely keeping our head above the waters relationships, finances, jobs, emotions, all running high. Take this moment right now to seek the presence of your way maker. Take this moment to call on your promise keeper. It may be this moment you need to confess before the Lord something that you're not proud of something you know has flown in the face of his character and nature. Take this moment right now to confess that before the Lord. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being the one who makes the way where we can't even see the way forward. Thank you so much for loving us despite ourselves, despite our sin, despite our brokenness. You came to love, to redeem, to forgive, to give us an abundant life. Father, we just pray that we trust in you this morning. We follow hard after you. We seek your face, not just your hand, not just your hand of blessing, but we seek your face to know you intimately, to walk with you so that others are drawn towards you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you that when we come to you, we come with all of our sin. We come with all of our transgressions. We come with all the things that we've done wrong, all the things that we've carried. And Father, we come to you and you say to us to lay our burdens down, to cast our cares before you. Father, thank you that we're not saved by anything we do, but we're saved by grace alone, through Christ alone, through faith alone. Father, we thank you that as we come to you, we don't have to clean ourselves up, Father, because we can't. But Lord, when we come to you, you will begin changing us, making us into what you want us to be. And so, the, so Father, we give you thanks this morning for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you as we're being seated. Our boys and girls are invited to go ahead and Go to Children's Church if they like. The ones grades one through five can go. We're so glad you're in here with us, worshiping and singing this morning. As we begin this morning, I want you to do something that's a little bit unconventional. I want you to, to in your mind, I want you to conjure up the very worst person that you can think of. Now, it may be a real person. It may be someone that you can think of, but think the very worst person either in history, the very worst person you know, or it may be somebody just fictional, but think about them. Think about all the bad things that they've done. Think about all those bad characteristics, everything they've done. All right, I want you to begin thinking about that. And, and as you think about that, I want you to just keep that person in your back of your mind for just a moment. We'll come back to them in a little bit. We're continuing talking about transformation, that work of transformation that God does in the hearts of people. And today we're going to be talking about the humbling of transformation using the life of Saul. Now there are two people named Saul in the Bible, two prominent people. One was the first king of Israel. He, he was a predecessor for David and, and there's some great stories about him. But we're not going to talk about him. We're talking about the other Saul. The second one, the one we'll discuss today is he was a prominent scholar in the Jewish community in the first century. You may know him better as Paul. He was the one that God used to write more of our Bible than any other one man. Saul's an interesting character. In Acts chapter 9, we read a little bit about Saul's life. Now, I love reading about Saul because he reminds me of God's transforming power. You see, most of us are so sure of our wrong-headed beliefs that we're willing to take bold action to defend them and desire to conquer those who believe otherwise. Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogue in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. Notice this is any followers, male, female, young, old, any followers. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Saul was so secure in his wrong-headed beliefs that he was willing to, not just to defend them verbally, but he was also willing to go out and act and take people into custody because they believed differently than what he did. The orthodox beliefs that he had in his heart were so strongly embedded that he believed that anybody who did anything different was so wrong that they deserved to be punished. We find ourselves many times so convinced of our wrong-headed beliefs that we're willing to defend them even though we really can't. We, we try to defend them. And when we can't, we believe we can conquer those who believe differently. You know, sometimes we believe something that's wrong and instead of saying, Lord, show me the error of my ways or Lord, show me how to defend what I believe, what we do is just attack people who believe differently. Saul was like that. But Saul didn't just talk a good game. Saul was one who acted. 
And just like Saul, we must all be humbled before we can fully see the truth and the power of the God who sent his son to pay the price for our sin, that price that we could never pay. Continuing next chapter 9, verse 3. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, this mission to go hunt down followers of Jesus, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. Now, tomorrow we're going to have a light from heaven quit shining down around us for a few minutes, aren't we? That's going to be startling. But we know it's coming. But Saul didn't know it was coming. The light suddenly shone down. And apparently this wasn't just a flashlight. This wasn't just the high beams of a vehicle. This was a light that was blinding. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul, Saul stood speechless for they heard the sound of someone's voice but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days, did not eat or drink. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be going on what you thought was a mission on behalf of what God wanted you to do and to suddenly be blinded by a light? And it was so transformative to him that he didn't even eat for three days. He, his life was shaken up. Everything that he believed had been broken right out from under him. The one who is persecuting, the one who he saw as the false prophet, that one spoke to him in a voice that could not be seen. So you see, we must all be humbled sometimes. I hope that we never have to be humbled by a bright light on the road. I hope we never have to be humbled by the, the truth of, of the wrongness in our hearts in such a way that it causes us physical injury. But Saul had to go through this because, you see, he was going the wrong direction. And even after he had been humbled, even after we have been humbled, sometimes it, it takes a while before our old reputation catches up with our new reality. Have you ever run into somebody who you used to know in your old life? My high school, the small little high school, it's so small we can't have a class reunion. We have a reunion of 20 or 30 classes that get together. And they get together every couple of years. And when we get together, it's always interesting because I still see those people the way they were the last time that I remember hanging around with them when they were 18 years old. And this last class reunion, a guy came up who, who I knew. We didn't know each other well. We weren't best friends, but we knew each other well enough. And immediately, when I saw him, I recognized who he was, and immediately the picture of who he was in the past came to my mind. He was a party guy. He was a guy who thought that pleasure could be found in all the earthly pursuits. And he knew me and knew that I was a pastor. And he came to me and said, Jerry, good to see you. Can I talk to you for a minute? I said, oh, I'd love to talk to you. And we sat down. And he began telling me the story of how a few years ago God got a hold of his heart. And God changed him from who he once was to who he now is. His old reputation preceded him because I remembered who he was. But God touched his life. Now, I still remembered all those things about him. But gradually the things of the past began to be replaced by what he was saying. He was speaking sincerely. He was speaking humbly. He was speaking about a man whose life was changed because he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, his Savior. He's a man who saw the error of his ways and was thankful that God gave him a chance to do something different. 
what an amazing thing it was to see. And so when we concluded our conversation, he walked away. And I couldn't help but think to myself, isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God to take someone who I thought was, was really too far gone and to make him different? Now, even after he was humbled, that reputation followed him. I'm sure I'm not the only one at that reunion who remembered who he used to be. I'm sure that many of us saw him and thought, oh, I remember how he was. But just a few moments with him showed me that God had changed his life. Acts chapter 19, verse 11, we read about Saul's reputation. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street in the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. This is somebody who God was sending to Saul. And God says, I've shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. And so Ananias was listening to God, and he said, but Lord. Ananias said, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Ananias said, God, he's got a reputation. I've heard his reputation, and I'm afraid. And I don't think that I want to go and be with him because, you see, I'm afraid he may be using this as a, as a ruse. He may somehow be using this event to grab me up and to terrorize me as he is so many others. You see, Saul had been humbled, but Ananias didn't know that. Ananias knew him by his reputation. But his new reality hadn't yet gotten into public. And so Ananias saw the truth of what Saul once was, but didn't yet know the truth of who Saul was now. You may be one of those people who at one time had a reputation that's quite a lot different than what you are now. You may be someone who, when you run to someone from your old life, or hesitant, oh, I hope they don't say what they know about me. Oh, I hope that they don't tar start talking about the things that I've done. One of the other frightening things about going to one, one of those reunions is that my wife goes with me, and she meets people who knew me back when I was a young man. Now, the young Jerry was not a terrible person, but the young Jerry made some silly mistakes. The young Jerry did some things that, looking back, you think, how could I have possibly done something so foolish? And here we are in a room full of people who all knew the old Jerry. So I always tell my wife, now, I want you to know that these people are a bunch of liars. And, and you, you need to know that they, they're going to be making stuff up about me. But she knows the truth. She knows the truth. I, I was never as bad as Saul, but I was someone who didn't deserve the salvation that God gave me. So even after we've been humbled by that transformation, that old reputation still follows us. We need to also understand that although that humbling might be painful, it could be a painful part of the process, God will surely bring us healing. And our greatest desire becomes to be obedient to God. Acts chapter 9 again, beginning in verse 17. So Ananias went and found Saul. God convinced Ananias it would be okay. So he went and he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward he ate some food and regained his strength. So you see this was not just a spiritual transformation. It began a physical transformation. He was able to then begin 
preparing his body and, and coming back to becoming what he needed to be to continue with life. He hadn't eaten for three days, but, but now he felt like he could eat. He could go on with his life. So God transformed him spiritually and physically. Then he was able to continue his life. If you continue on the story of Saul, you'll see where God changed his name to Paul. He became a bold advocate. I think Paul spent more time in jail than he did out of jail. So many of the books of the New Testament that Paul wrote or that he dictated were done when he was in prison. He'll say, this is from Paul. Here I am in chains. And there he is witnessing to the jailers and there he is witnessing to people who wanted to capture him, wanted to hurt him. So let me remind you who Saul was. Saul was someone who hated followers of Jesus Christ. Hated them so much that he kidnapped them. He hated them so much that he tortured them. He hated them so much that he was the one who caused them to be killed for their faith. Now I want you to compare yourself to Saul. Are you, are you too bad for God to transform? The enemy would love to tell you that, well, that's all good, but you're just too far gone. You've done too many bad things. There's just too much in your past that God can't forgive. Friend, let me tell you, that's a lie. The truth is that God can and will transform anybody if we will just allow him. So let's compare yourself to Saul. So how many believers have you killed or tortured? There's two things that we need to think about when we think about the life of Saul and what God did. First of all, and this is the most difficult lesson for you and I to remember. Remember that person you thought of in the, at the beginning? Maybe a historical figure, maybe somebody you made up, maybe somebody you know, maybe your neighbor, maybe a relative, the worst person in the world. Whoever that person is, Remember that God doesn't give up on anyone. And because God doesn't give up on them, we don't give up on them. Our job, when we encounter people like this who are so evil, so far from God, is to pray for them. And to pray fervently that God will touch their heart. We don't pray and say, God, would you get them off my back? God, would you teach them a lesson? God, I wish you'd slap them around a little bit and straighten them out. No, our prayer is, God, would you reach them with your love? Would they understand that Jesus Christ died for them too? We never give up on anyone. And we, as followers of Jesus Christ, need to be the ones to take the first step to reach out to them. Now, it may be uncomfortable. It may be inconvenient. But that's the calling on our lives, is to love people right where they are. Okay, I had you think about the worst person you've ever met, or the worst person you can imagine. I want you to think now about the very best person in your life, the very best person you've ever met. The one who you say, this person exemplifies all the qualities of a believer in Christ. This, this is a person who I hold in high esteem, and, and I really think... I know they're not perfect, but boy, they're close. They're so great. Over the last few months and weeks and days, as the lifelight of my mother flickered out, and she went through the veil on Wednesday to be with the Lord, I've had time to review her life and think back about it, and I've had a lot of people comment, people who've known her all of her life, and People have known her for many, many years, and, and I get the same comment over and over. She was really a good, nice person. She was a fantastic mother. She was a wonderful wife. She was a great follower of Jesus Christ. She taught Sunday school. She sang in choir. 
She was even a church secretary a couple of times. She did a lot of things to build up the kingdom. People would call her and ask her to pray for them. When somebody was sick or somebody had a need in their life, she would be the first one there with a casserole dish. You know, the old Baptist, uh, the, the Baptist thing that we do. You know, we have really three things. We do in the Baptist church. We do the Lord's Supper. We do baptism. We do casserole. And she would do that. She always made sure that our clothes were clean. She always made sure that we were in church every time the doors were open. There probably were some faults in her life. I, I don't know what they were, but she, I'm sure she had some. But I want you to know, there's, a, there's something you need to realize. My mother, who was great in my eyes, and that person you thought of that's the most horrible person in life, they both have some need, and that same need is this. They're both desperately in need of a Savior. Because no matter how perfect someone may seem to be, no matter how wonderful they may be on the outside, the truth is, inside, there are people who have disobeyed God. What the Bible calls sin. The Bible says that all of us, every one of us, without exception, has sinned. Well, what is sin? Well, there are some things we could look up in the Bible and see what specific sins, but let me give you a general term that's good. Sin is when we think we know better than God. Sin is when we say, yeah, God, I say you, I know you say a certain thing, but I think I know better in this situation. God, I'm going to do it my way because my way seems better than yours. Now, when you think about it that way, you think, boy, that sure sounds foolish. That sure sounds insolent. That sure sounds ridiculous. Yes. But in the moment, it sounded like a good idea. How many times you said, well, I thought it was a good idea at the time. The enemy can twist and warp the truth of God to make it seem that you're doing something okay when it's really sinful, it's really disobedient to God. So it doesn't matter if you're that worst person or if you're the best person. Whoever, everyone has a common need for a Savior. That's why God sent His one and only Son. The Bible says all of us have sinned. We've fallen short of what God wants for us. We have missed the mark. And it says that there is a penalty to be paid for that. What is that penalty? The Bible says death. Now, we're not talking about physical death. We're talking about spiritual death, eternal death. You know, physical death comes to all of us. It's just one of those things that happens in life. If, unless we're here when Jesus comes again, we're going to experience that physical death. But the most frightening thing is that eternal spiritual death, to be separated from God forever. It says that all of us have sinned. It says that we deserve the wages of what we deserve. What we've earned by our sin is death. It says, but... The gift of God, something freely given that we cannot deserve or earn. That gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. By grace we're saved through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, we can't do anything to earn our salvation. I don't care how much you change your life around. I don't care how much money you give to the church. I don't care how many great things you do. I don't care how many wonderful deeds you accomplish. It will not earn you one second in heaven. In fact, the Bible tells us that our best, the very best we've done, our very best acts are just like filthy rags to be thrown away. Our good works that we think are so good in God's eyes are still horrible. Why is that? Because we can't do enough. We can't do good enough things to earn our way into heaven. Saul was a horrible, horrible person. God got a hold of him and changed his life, and he did great and wonderful things. But you see, all those great and wonderful things he did as an apostle, all those great things he did, writing and teaching and mentoring, all those great things didn't save Paul. It was the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that saved Paul. When Paul put his faith in Jesus Christ, that is where he found his salvation. So you and I have a choice to make. 
We have a choice to make how we're going to respond to what happened to Saul. Friend, you may be here this morning in need of that transformation. You may be like Saul. You may be headed down the wrong path and God may not send a light to shine down. God may not blind you, but God's going to confront you with his truth. And the truth is this. You need a savior. You don't need a better plan. You don't need a better lifestyle. You don't need to change your life. You need a savior. And that savior will change your life. That cha- savior will get you a better plan. You got to get things in the correct order. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what your heart is saying to you this morning. But I feel like there are some of you here who have put your faith in Jesus Christ a long time ago and you're walking with him and you're doing your very best and you're you're relying on that salvation and good for you. But there are some of you who are here and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been maybe coming to our church for a while. Maybe you've been to a lot of churches. Maybe you've heard a lot of sermons. But maybe you're feeling a stirring in your heart you've never felt before. That stirring is the Holy Spirit saying to you, it's time. It's time to allow Jesus to transform you. To transform you from what you are now to what you could be. From what the enemy has made you do to what he wants you to do. How does that happen? It doesn't happen through anything you can do or say. You can't earn it. You can't say any magical words. There's no incantation. What you do is just humbly go before God and say, God, I'm desperately in need of your son, Jesus Christ. God, I need that salvation which only you offer. Allow him to enter your heart. Allow him to change your life. That's the humbling of transformation that we're talking about. We have to humble ourselves before God and say, God, I desperately need you. In a moment, the worship team is going to come and sing a song, and Trey and I are going to be up here at the front. I want to invite you, if you need that transformation, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, would you do that this morning? Don't leave this place until you have things right with God. Maybe you've put your faith in him a long time ago, but you sort of strayed. You've, you've gotten off on the wrong path. Maybe you need to come and let us pray with you and, and encourage you. Maybe you need someone just to pray with you. Maybe you've had some struggles this week. Maybe you need someone to pray with you and to give you that strength that only God can give you. Maybe you need to come and be a part of this church and join this church, whatever it is, in the next few moments, would you be willing to do business with God, to listen to him and follow and do what he says for you to do? Would you stand? Father, the life of Saul reminds us that there is evil in the world. But it reminds us more that there is a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. It's in only his name that we can find our salvation. Father, we pray that you would touch every heart here this morning, every heart that's listening online. Lord, change us into what you want us to be. Lord, make us better as only you can do. Lord, not because we need to be better, but because we need to be closer to you. Lord, change us into who you want us to be. Make us who only you can make us to be. Father, bring joy. Bring that salvation to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.
seat please amen isn't God good the God that transforms the God that changes lives so excited to be here with you at worship this morning thank you for being a part of you join us online thank you for being a part of a worship if you came in this morning hopefully you were given a bulletin and I'd love for you to grab that and uh, inside you'll find some various announcements things that are taking place here at the church soon there's also a tear-out portion of the bulletin that we would love for you to take the time to tear out and fill out. You could also uh, scan the QR code. You can do it digitally. Uh, that's always helpful either way. But this way it helps us connect with you and know how we can pray for you, how we can help you take your next steps. And we always say it here at Oak Ridge, everybody's got a next step. So let's not stand still. Let's take our next step forward. Find a place to connect, serve. Find a place to find uh, this place to come and be a part of our fellowship, or maybe it's to um, make a profession of faith in Jesus. And if coming down forward, you felt the Holy Spirit speaking to you, but you didn't make it forward, that's okay. You don't have to wait till next Sunday. Scan that QR code, fill it out. We'll get back with you this week. We promise we'll get with you. And we'd love to connect with you, help you find your next step. There are several announcements that I want to uh, make sure we hit. Oh, I guess I, how about how about giving? That's a great one to start off with. Uh, we always talk about giving radically and gener uh, with great generosity. Uh, and, and for us, giving is a part of what we do in worship. And so if the Lord has laid it in your heart to, to worship through giving, there are offering plates at the back of the sanctuary. You can use an offering envelope that's in the seat back in front of you. You can also give online, however the Lord is leading you. But giving is a very important part of how we worship and how we continue to do ministry every week. Um, We've been giving uh, for the last month to our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. These are offerings that go directly to help planting churches here in North America. Our goal was $2,000. I think we're just about there, but if the Lord is leading you to give to that, this will be the last week that we have the envelopes there. You can always give, but the envelopes will be here this Sunday. We would love to uh, roll that out this next month and, and send that on uh, hitting our goal. Uh, did you get y'all's poem? I almost said poem set this. Oh, my gosh. I cannot get away from that. Oh, I can't get away from saying the word poinsettia. Lilies, I hope you got your lilies last week. Uh, that, was, that was good to get those. Those were awfully beautiful. A couple of other announcements. Uh, ladies, uh, it's, this is a tea. Uh, got to do tea, right? And it's on May the 4th, and uh, you're going to be celebrating May the 4th be with you. It's a Disney, uh, I mean a, a Star Wars theme. Star Wars. Yeah, Star Wars theme. I'm just kidding. It's not really. But uh, ladies' tea on May the 4th. I think they're going to have tea and crumpets or something. Uh, no, there's lunch actually provided. It's 11 o'clock to 1. And this has been an exciting time for all you ladies to connect and to fellowship and have a great time of encouraging one another. So please sign up. They would love to know how, how many to anticipate for. It's going to be an exciting time for you guys on Saturday, May the 4th. Um, just another couple of quick things. As Jerry mentioned, uh, his mom did pass away this week. And they will be having services tomorrow at uh, Seaside Reed Chapel. Is that right, Jerry? Uh, 12.30 is visitation and 1.30 is the services. And if, if you have the time off tomorrow and you'd like to, to stop by and encourage Jerry and his family, I know that they would appreciate that as well. And Jerry, we, we have, been, have been praying for you and your family this week. We'll continue uh, this week as well. Um, I was also asked to mention in the hallway is a banner as you head out towards the children's building. Uh, if you would like to know where the search pastoral search committee is, where they're at in the process, they've got a banner in there that tells you where they're at in the process. So please check that out on your way out. You'll see exactly where they're at. And lastly, I want to say uh, welcome, uh, Curtis Grimes. Thanks for being here with us, you and your band this morning. Yeah. Uh, some of y'all know Curtis. He was here uh, at part of our uh, jamboree in September, and we were ex so excited uh, to have you guys. And they're doing WinFest. And what time y'all playing today? 1230. So we got to get them out of here quick. It's 1230. <laughs> So thanks for coming and joining us for worship. And you guys, if y'all go, go grab lunch and, and go see uh, Curtis Grimes and his band uh, at, at WinFest this week. If you're a first-time guest, we're so glad you're here. We'd love to connect with you at our Connection Corner on the way out. Cherry will be back there. Got a special gift he would love to share with you guys on your way out. Let's stand up. I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer. Thank you so much for being a part of our worship service. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house spending this time with our brothers and sisters 
in Christ. Father, we just pray that we go out today honoring you, magnifying you, and praising you so that everybody who sees us and hears us are drawn to you and your greatness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, because you got a lie.